What distinguishes a good writer from a great one? Is it the authenticity of their characters, the exhilaration of their narrative's conflicts, the sophistication of their arcs, the complexity of their worlds, or the skill of their prose? No. Unlike good writers, great writers not only succeed in ushering a compelling narrative, full of authentic characters and compelling conflicts, but equally utilize their stories to strike at the depths of reality itself, to reveal to us the truths that lie just beneath the surface of our very existence. Great writers create fantasies in order to tell the truth. Perhaps no other writer quantifies this very essence more than that of Fyodor Dostoevsky. It is through the psychological torment of Raskolnikov's conscience, the moral convictions of Ivan, and the contradictory ramblings and melancholy recollections of the underground man that we, as his readers, have come to understand more about the nature of our existence and that of society. He was a genius of literary realism and one of the greatest novelists of all time. Yet, just as with any other man, his genius was not simply born but rather molded, shaped, and formed. Thus, to understand him, to understand the nature of his craft, we must understand the story that shaped him. This is the life of Dostoevsky. Despite his fame as a renowned novelist, the young Dostoevsky's formal education consisted of a rather different pursuit. This was due to his father, Mikhail Andreevich Dostoevsky, who dismissed the naturally artistic whims of his sons. As a result, Dostoevsky entered the Military Engineering Academy on January 16, 1838, instead of enrolling at Moscow University to develop his literary acumen. During his time at the Academy, Dostoevsky formed friendships with other artistically inclined students that would later shape his understandings and ideals. One such friend, of which Dostoevsky attributed significance to, was Ivan Nikolaevich Shidlovsky. Shidlovsky was a graduate of the Military Engineering Academy and five years Dostoevsky's senior. He met him at a hotel with his father and brother in Petersburg, and he wrote poetry and was known for his recitations and speakership. Of Shidlovsky, Dostoevsky wrote in a letter describing him as the embodiment of the right portrait of a man that Shakespeare and Schiller have given us but even then he was quite capable of sinking into the gloomy mania of Byronesque characters. Even in 1870, Dostoevsky recalled his friendship with Shidlovsky with reverence. To me he was a great man, and he does not deserve that his name be forgotten. Nonetheless, as for being a student at the academy, another friend of his, Konstantin Trutovsky, described him as, There was no student in the entire institution with less of a military bearing than Fyodor Dostoevsky. He moved clumsily and jerkily. His uniform hung awkwardly on him, and his knapsack, shako, and rifle all looked like some sort of feather he had been forced to wear for a time and which lay heavily on him. Soon, tragedy struck the young student on June 16, 1839, when he was informed of his father's death. Upon receiving word of such an event, Dostoevsky experienced his first of many epileptic seizures that would plague him for the rest of his life. Though the cause of his father's demise on June 8, 1839 still remains inconclusive, certain accounts from various family members attribute Mikhail Andreevich Dostoevsky's death as an act of murder committed by his serfs. According to Fyodor Dostoevsky's daughter, Mikhail Dostoevsky was murdered as an act of revenge for his cruel treatment by his serfs whist traveling by carriage from his property in Darovo to Cheremoshia. In another account, such as the one by Fyodor Dostoevsky's younger brother, his father was murdered by a gang of 15 peasants out of fear of retribution against a particularly rude insult one of their troop committed against him. As for the truth of the case itself, no witnesses came forth, no evidence was preserved, no murderers were discovered, and no judicial inquiry took place. His official cause of death is stated as the result of an apoplectic stroke. What remains certain was the cruelty of his father's character, prone to violent outburst of anger, alcoholism, and a propensity for sexual relations with his younger serfs, such as the 14-year-old Akulina and 16-year-old Katya. It was perhaps from his father that Dostoevsky drew inspiration from when characterizing the vile Fyodor Karamazov. All his life long he analyzed the reasons for that horrible death. When he was working on the characterization of Fyodor Karamazov, 
perhaps he recalled his father's miserliness, which caused his sons so much suffering and angered them so, and his drunkenness and the physical revulsion he inspired in his children. Eventually, Dostoevsky obtained the rank of engineer cadet and moved away from the academy. On January 5, 1846, Dostoevsky's first novel, Poor Folk, was published in Nekrasov's Peterburgsky Spornik. Dostoevsky's first novel was a commercial and critical success. After reading his work, the renowned Russian literary critic Vissarion Grigorievich Belinsky proclaimed, The most striking thing about Dostoevsky is his astonishing ability to bring his characters to life before the reader's eyes and to draw their portraits in only two or three words. And then, what profound, what warm compassion for the poor and the suffering, Tell me, is he a poor man who has suffered much himself? He must be, only a genius with the insight to grasp in one minute what it takes an ordinary man many years to understand could write such a book at the age 25. Soon after publishing his first novel, Dostoevsky resigned from his post as lieutenant engineer to focus full-time on writing his novels. At long last, the career of Dostoevsky the novelist began. He soon published his second novel, The Double, on February 1, 1846, centering on the life of Yakov Petrovich Golyatkin, a titular counselor who attends a birthday party uninvited. He is subsequently expulsed from it and is forced to return home amid a snowstorm. On his way home, he encounters a man that looks exactly like him. They initially are great friends. Nonetheless, the double's attempts to control Golyatkin sours their friendship and, in the end, Golyatkin has a psychotic break and is dragged off into an asylum. The double, unlike his first novel, was not widely acclaimed and was received by most critics, including Dostoevsky himself, as a failure. Soon, Dostoevsky and Belinsky would split due to ideological differences. Belinsky's atheistic socialism clashed against the orthodox Christianity of Dostoevsky, though the straw that eventually broke the camel's back was their disagreements on aesthetics and the arts. My views were fundamentally opposed to Belinsky's. I reproached him with trying to impose a specific and unworthy purpose on literature, reducing it solely to description, if one may call it that, of newspaper reports and scandalous happenings. I protested that Bile would never win anybody over and that you would simply bore everyone to death. Belinsky became very angry with me and in the end we passed from coldness to a formal break so that we did not meet at all in the last years of his life. After leaving the influence of Belinsky and his colleagues, Dostoevsky soon found company amongst the Petrashevsky circle in 1846. Their gatherings took place on Fridays where they would discuss the great social issues of the day, atheism, utopian socialism, censorship, serfdom, public trial, and family and marriage. The meetings, according to Aksharumov, were like an interesting kaleidoscope of the most diverse opinions on contemporary events, government ordinances, and the latest in various fields of knowledge. News of what was going on in the city was discussed here, people talked loudly and without restraint about everything. Now and then some expert would give a sort of lecture. With the arrival of Nikolai Speshnev in 1848, however, the Petrashevsky Circle became something much more than a band of intellectuals. He was a well-educated and intelligent Kursk landowner and leader of the Propaganda Society. He joined the Circle, not with the intention of continuing its intellectual exercises, but to institute an uprising. He formed his own secret society within the Petrashevsky Circle to fulfill his intended aim, of which Dostoevsky himself became part of. Regardless, the activities of Nikolai Speshnev were discovered, and on April 23, 1849, the members of the Petrashevsky Circle were arrested and imprisoned. As punishment for their acts against the Tsar, the members of the Petrashevsky Circle were sentenced to death by firing squad. On December 22, 1849, Dostoevsky was delivered to Semyonov Place for his execution. Once they arrived, the condemned men formed a column by order of the adjutant general Sumarakov and were escorted towards three narrow gray posts. Under the shadow of their scaffold, the condemned men were read their sentence by the auditor who stood over them from the magnanimity of the platform. Having examined the cases presented by the Army Judiciary Commission, 
The Auditory at General finds all the accused guilty of planning to overthrow the state system and sentences them all to death by the firing squad. The Auditor paused for a moment so as to emphasize the consequence of his message and resolutely proclaimed, His Majesty the Emperor has written in his own hand on the sentence. So be it. Per procedure of execution, the Auditor then began to read out the individual sentences of each prisoner. Of Dostoevsky, he stated, Retired Engineer Lieutenant Fyodor Dostoevsky, 27, for participation in criminal plans, for circulating a private letter that contained infamous expressions about the Russian Orthodox Church and supreme authority, and for an attempt to disseminate writings against the government by means of a hand-printing press to be put to death by the firing squad. At last, the formalities of the spectacle had come to a close. The prisoners were stripped of their summer cloaks and given loose gowns of coarse linen. Then the men were divided into groups of three to be bound, in turn, to the three gray posts before the barrel's end of the squad of executioners. As for the first conspirators to die, the execution master called out three names, Petrashevsky, Mombeli, and Grigoriev. The three men were tied up, each to his own pole as the other conspirators, Dostoevsky included, witnessed in horror. Three platoons of 16 men each took up positions about 12 yards away from each post, their guns at the ready. The soldiers loaded their rifles and hoods were placed over the prisoners' heads so they would not see the moment the muskets opened fire. Indignant to the end, Petrashevsky shook off his hood and proclaimed, I am not afraid to look death in the eyes. At their superior's orders, the soldiers took aim at the condemned. Any second now, a hailstorm of bullets would carve a hole as large as one's fist straight into each man's chest in a single concerted flash of gunfire. Suddenly, in the distance, there came the noise of a horse-drawn cart galloping at full speed. After coming to a complete stop, a man exited forth from it and gave General Sumarikov a sealed packet. At the last possible minute, the sentence of the Petrashevsky Circle was commuted to four years of penal servitude in Siberia by order of Tsar Nicholas I. On February 14, 1854, Dostoevsky was released from Siberia. He was forced to serve the Siberian Army Corps of the 7th Line Battalion as part of his sentence. Despite serving four years of harsh labor in Siberia, Dostoevsky possessed a newfound zeal for literature and requested his brother to send him copies of Kant, Hegel, the Koran, physics, and much more. Regardless, as a result of his sentence, Dostoevsky himself was unable to legally publish any works of his own. As such, he appealed to Eduard Totleben, whom he was acquainted with at the Engineering Academy. In the letter, he expressed his case. I was guilty. I am fully aware of it. I was caught intending but no more to act against the government. I was condemned legally and justly. A long experience, hard and painful, sobered me up and changed my thoughts in many ways. But at that time, at that time, I was blind. I believed in theories and utopias. Thoughts and even convictions change. The whole person changes. And what is it like now to suffer for something that no longer exists? What has changed in me into the opposite? To suffer for former errors which I myself already see as unfounded, to feel the strength and ability to do at least something to atone for the uselessness of the former, and languish in inaction. Once I was encouraged by the favorable reception of the public on the literary path, I would like to have permission to print. Examples of this were, political criminals, due to the attention and mercy favored to them, received permission to write and print even before me. I have always considered the title of a writer to be the noblest, most useful title. I have the conviction that only on this path could I truly be useful. Perhaps I would attract at least some attention to myself, would again acquire a good name for myself and at least somewhat secure. Thoughts and even convictions change, and the whole man, and what is it like now to suffer for what no longer exists? What has changed in me into the opposite? To suffer for former errors? which I already see the groundlessness, to feel the strength and ability to do at least something to atone for the futility of the former, and languish in inaction. Moved by his sentiment, General Eduard Totleben saw to it that Dostoevsky's capacity to be published was reinstated. Soon Dostoevsky married Maria Dmitrievna Iseeva on February 7, 1857. Nonetheless, their marriage was not a happy one and came to an end on 1864 with her death. 
The first two parts of Crime and Punishment were published in the Russian Messenger on January and February 1866. In mid-September, he promised the editor of the Russian Messenger, Fyodor Stolovsky, that he would complete his short story, The Gambler, by November of that year. To complete the task, Dostoevsky hired a secretary at the behest of a friend by the name of Anna Grigorievna Snitkina. After 26 days of work, they completed The Gambler on October 30th. Later on, Dostoevsky and Snitkina married on February 15, 1867. The couple always found themselves in dire financial straits throughout their lives, which was not helped by Dostoevsky's gambling addiction. He published The Idiot serially in The Russian Messenger from 1868 to 1869, after receiving word that the socialist revolutionary group People's Vengeance murdered one of its members on November 21, 1869, Dostoevsky began work on his novel, Demons. It was published serially from 1871-72 in The Russian Messenger. The novel was later released in complete form by the Dostoevsky Publishing Company, founded by Dostoevsky and Snitkina, on January 1873. His last novel, The Brothers Karamazov, was written over the span of two years and published serially in The Russian Messenger from January 1879, to November 1880. Dostoevsky died four months later on February 9, 1881, as the result of a pulmonary hemorrhage. Who was this man, this novelist who endured such hardships and misery? A man who could not pursue his dreams in youth, condemned to suffer in labor camps for his associations, and frequent pauper by his own vice. What we have before us is his life and his works. Despite all his misery, he kept on writing. He kept writing to the very end, even when the whole world was against him. It is through his torment, as his readers, that we are able to benefit from the leagues of experience of the human heart he acquired, how its ideals and passions can lead it astray, and most importantly, how it can endure. This was the life of Dostoevsky. Thank you.